I think for whatever reasons, I've always had a problem with authority. I've always had a deep mistrust of anyone claiming to either know sort of the secret of something or, or, or even codified knowledge, um, which is something I ran into plenty when I went to business school. Like, hey, here's how you run a successful business. And I always kept thinking like, I don't know, man. Like this stuff we're learning right here, that, that just seems like one sliver for one slice of time. And, and usually a slice of time that, that's not now and usually a sliver that's not me or I can't relate to. And I think perhaps that's some of it too, that I just, a lot of what I was sort of taught in business school and school in general, I couldn't relate to it. Like, it didn't feel like that applied to me. Um, and that came to a lot of the rules about how you're supposed to build a business and, and so forth. So I think the foundation of, of a lot of the work that we're doing is, is basically just that <laughs> deep-seated mistrust of learning <laughs> from other people's experiences. <laughs> Um, so we basically reverted to first principle. Like I'm going to learn as much as I can from my own experiences, which I know on a sort of societal level is uh, that's perhaps not that great. And I mean, if you try to figure everything out from scratch, are you going to come up with something that's as good as, as what other people have spent decades or millennia perfecting? Well, in a lot of cases, perhaps yes, it is because perhaps right now all those lessons from two decades ago just don't apply right anymore. Um, and being taught them actually make you worse off than not knowing them at all. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. David, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. So, um... You know, it's interesting because I came across you by way of our mutual friend, Mike Rohde, but I also had, uh, you know, heard about your work and and listened to you on the Stanford Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Series. Uh, Obviously, you know, being a co-founder of 37 Signals, you're quite well known probably by a lot of people, maybe not necessarily by some in our audience. And uh, ever since I heard that talk, I was really intrigued by, you know, the way you see the world and the the way you look at business uh, and everything about your story. So on that note, can you tell us uh, a bit about your story, your journey, your background and how that has brought you to everything that you're up to in the world sure uh it's definitely a bit of a tale uh well i'm from denmark originally Uh, i moved to the u.s in in 2005 by then i had been working with uh, jason fried my business partner at Basecamp, formerly 37 signals already for a couple of years and that sort of snowballed the whole thing um and it was really by chance so I was a um, reader of the Signal versus Noise blog, which is a company web blog of 37 Signals that was started back in 1999. Mm-hmm. And I think I started reading that blog around actually 1999 or maybe 2000. And at some point, I think in 2001, um, Jason had posted a couple of questions on the blog, just basically saying, hey, I'm trying to learn PHP. Can you help me figure this stuff out? Uh, I think it was pagination or something like that. And being a fan of, um, of the blog, I just wrote Jason an email and said, hey, sure, I'd be happy to help. Here's uh, how you do this, this, and the other thing. And um, we started trading emails back and forth. And, and before uh, we knew it, Jason had basically decided, eh, maybe it's easier just to hire this Dane from Copenhagen uh, than it is to actually figure out how to do programming. So I started working with Jason um, back in 2001. I was still in Copenhagen. We hadn't even spoken on the phone. This was all just email and instant messenger back uh, back in 2001. And we started working on, uh, what was it? Oh yeah, uh, Jason had, um, back in the beginning of the mid 90s, he had been working on um, FileMaker Pro software that he was selling on his own, basically the shareware software. It was software for managing your collection of different things, managing your collection of music or books or whatever. And he wanted to basically bring that online. So we worked together on this app called Single File. It's a way to track your book collection, who you lent your books out to, which books you had, so on and so forth. And um, that went really well. We launched it. 
some people liked it. Never really took off, but um, it was the first project we did together, and then we just started working together. Uh, Jason had the 37 Sequels company, the, I think four people there at the time, and they were doing all this web design work, and a fair number of those web design clients didn't already have programmers on staff, so uh, enter me. I would do the, um, the program work for that. And that went on for, what, a couple of years. And, uh, and a couple of years in, then, I think 2000, yeah, 2003, we kind of just realized that the way we were managing these projects were not sufficient. Um, things would get dropped. We wouldn't really be uh, on top of things. It would look unprofessional to the customer. They wouldn't know where to go to get the latest updates on their project and so forth. And we thought, hey, we know how to build software. Can't we build some software to solve this problem? And that was the beginning of Basecamp. And uh, the beginning of Basecamp was also the beginning of Ruby on Rails, which is another thing I've uh, uh, started. Um, so in 2003, we were going to start on this Basecamp thing, uh, this project management tool. And this was the first project in a while for me where we didn't have any technical dictation. Dictates Like, there was no client saying, hey, you have to make this in PHP, or you have to make it in Java, or you have to make it in Perl, or whatever people were making at the time. This was all open-ended. So I thought, hey, great. Greenfield opportunity, brand new app. I can try something. And at that time, I'd been reading um, Martin Fowler, and Kent Beck, and Dave Thomas, and uh, actually, not so much Kent Beck. I don't think Kent was into Ruby at the time. Anyway, Martin Fowler and, and Dave Thomas were big proponents of Ruby, the, the programming language out of Japan. And in 2003, that was not a popular language whatsoever. Um, but these guys have been writing about it in IEEE magazine and a few other industry magazines. So I thought, hey, I have the chance to do whatever I want. These guys really seem to like Ruby and all wish that they could use Ruby in, in a professional setting, but for various reasons their clients won't let them, I'm gonna use Ruby. And what I, of course, well, I found two things. First, I, I found that I was going to give myself the challenge that in, in one week, I'd see how far I could get. And actually, I think I said in one month even. And after one week, I had realized, holy smokes, Ruby is blowing my mind in ways I didn't. I thought about programming in, all, uh, in a whole different light after just one week of exposure to Ruby. And this was after having programmed to some extent and in some capacity for a couple of years already. And I just thought, this is exactly what I've been looking for. This speaks to all my sensibilities, all my sort of leanings on design. This is amazing. And then it didn't really matter that A, not a lot of people were using it, and B, not I mean, even less of those people have actually used it to build web applications. Uh, I thought this was just such a great language. It fit my brain so incredibly well. Not only my brain, it felt like like I was coming home, like I, I found my tribe. Um, he was a, a group of people, and Matt in particular, the uh, creator of the language that cared about the programmer before he cared about the machine. And I know that has echoes throughout the history of programming, but nobody was really saying it and putting it into those terms as, as Matt's was at the time. And not only putting it into those terms in terms of how he's speaking about the language, but you could just feel it from the language that that was what he cared about. So I adopted Ruby wholehearted and I started building Basecamp in it. And as I was building Basecamp, I, I needed all the stuff that just wasn't available in Ruby, that all the stuff that we take for granted in a modern uh, web development world today, all the libraries for talking to a database and generating HTML and, and all that stuff. I just started building it myself. And I found that um, that was, came very natural to some extent to me. I really like building my own tools because I'm very particular about my tools and what I enjoy using and how I enjoy using it and it has to be just so, just right. And there's no better way to getting it just so, just right than just basically making your own stuff. So that went on for about uh, six months or so and we released uh, the first version of Basecamp in the, what was it, February of 2004 or something like that. And then I released the first version of Ruby on Rails about three or four months later, also in 2004. So that's basically the genesis story of both Basecamp and Ruby on Rails, probably the two things I'm, I'm most known for and, and the two things I still spent the 
vast majority of my time on 11 years later. Mm. All right. So one of the things I want to do is go into the journey before the journey, sort of, you know, your moments of significance, uh, early childhood and formative experiences uh, growing up that actually led you down this path. Sure. Well, it's kind of funny because I've always been into computers. I got my first, well, actually, I think I got my first exposure to computers. That was the Commodore 64. Uh, <laughs> a friend um, living on the same street as, as me, I think, well, were we like four or five years old or something like that? Uh, probably five. Five, I think. Um, I, re- I have this memory of playing Year Kung Fu. I don't know if you know that game, but it's like a, a f- early fighting game for the Commodore 64. I think it was released in, I don't know, 82 or something. And I remember sitting around like the TV screen this Commodore 64 was hooked up to. And here we were, like all the kids on my street, maybe five or six of us, each taking our turn to play this. And I just thought like, wow, this is just such an amazing world. Like playing computer games is just incredible. Like I, I'd spend as much time as I possibly could on it. And then I think maybe a year later, I didn't quite get the computer that I wanted. I wanted a Commodore 64, but um, my dad was working on fixing TVs and always sort of trading hi-fi equipment with people. And somehow he had traded and bartered his way to an Amstrad 646, I think it was called. Um, So I got my first computer at, at six and just loved playing with it. I, I dabbled a little bit in programming, which basically meant at the time I typed in programs from magazines. That was how we did it. Like you didn't distribute software as, as actually executable code at the time. You distributed text, printed text, and then somebody else typed it in. But what, what's funny is that that actually didn't go that much further. Like I was not one of those kids that got into programming and just started programming at year six. Not at all. I, I dabbled with it just to the extent of like I knew how to type in a program and I knew how to execute it and so forth. And I kept playing with computers. I kept playing video games for, for year to, years to come. But I never really got into programming, which is, which is funny because a little later, maybe when I was 14 or something, uh, I think that's, a, that's another milestone. I went to um, a demo party. In, in Europe, there was a, a very active demo scene where people would make basically – sort of computer music videos um, on both the Commodore 64, but at that time, the Amiga. And basically just about making these sort of elaborate graphical demonstrations. And there was this huge party called The Party um, in, in, a, in a city in, uh, in Denmark that was the largest gathering of demo programmers and, and hangarounds of the scene. I love what, how these things just sort of claim these words. Like it was The Party and the whole thing was called The Scene. Um, anyway, so I, I arrived at this place. I didn't really, I don't remember if I actually knew anyone. I, maybe I Somehow I'd heard it from someone or something. But anyway, at this party, I dragged my Amiga 500 and my TV across the country, basically on a train, because, I mean, it's not like we had laptops or anything. You had to bring physically your computer. So I brought it to this huge hall in this small town in, in Denmark called Aas, I think. And it was just this huge hall, and there was like, I don't know, 2,000 people in there, and I set up my thing on one of the, the desks, and, and somehow I just met all the people in computers that I would know for the next, well, I still know a bunch of these people, but everyone who would otherwise have an impact on, on me learning computers more definitely at this one event. Mm-hmm. Like, accidentally just sitting down at the right table. I met uh, Alan Otgar, the um, uh, creator of TextMate, there at age 14, I met a, a bunch of other Danish um, scene programmers and demo coders that I would uh, later end up working with uh, once I graduated high school in a, um, in a web shop. Um, just a bunch of people at this one magical party, at this one conference, which was, uh, which was really funny. But what was funny still too was, so I met all these people, a bunch of them were programmers, a bunch of them were demo programmers, like hardcore assembler writing programmers. And still, I didn't pick up programming. Like, I was still sort of on the edges. I, I spent my time um, uh, in the scene trading. Like, I ran a um, uh, pirated software bulletin board, a BBS back in the day. It was called uh, Electronic Confusion. 
Um, and I ran that at like age 15. I had like um, three phone lines coming into my tiny little room in my parents' house um, and, and actually paying for it selling pirated CDs. So I was sort of around the scene and involved in all this stuff and involved with computers, but again, didn't learn how to program. Um, really until late 90s, maybe 98, 99, uh, was when we sort of moved away from the BBS world and, and started working on, on websites. Um, and I was still into games, so it was gaming websites, and I just sort of very slowly got into it, first learning Microsoft ASP, then learning some PHP, and then from there it went. But by the time I really sort of knew enough about programming to say, well, I can program, I was 20 or 21. Hmm. Well, let me ask you this. Why do you think that so many people remain on the edges of things like this before diving into them? It, it's really interesting, I think. Uh, part of it was that I entered into a group that was much older than me. I mean, I showed up at this party, I was 14. Uh, the other people there were, I don't know, 17, 18, 19, 20 or older. Mm. So they sort of, they already knew it. Like they had already figured it out. Um, and I don't know, there was just something about entering in with that group, and I just didn't know this stuff, that I couldn't, uh, that didn't really work. Like, I, I, one of the things I think about often is um, this research into what's it called, complementary skills. Like how in a family, for example, if uh, a brother or sister or whatever picks up one skill and gets really good at it, uh, it kind of influences what the rest of the family does. And then oftentimes, like, nobody else picks up that skill. Because that group already has that skill. It's more valuable if they pick up some other skill, something that the group doesn't have already. So that's kind of what I did. Like I picked up, like, all right, I'm going to run the, the BBS for this. I'm going to get us all the software and, and trade all this stuff. Because nobody's doing that in my group right now, so let me have a swing at that. Hmm. Do you think that uh, you could have known at a time that these people were going to have such a significant impact uh, on the work you ended up doing with your life? Or do you think that's only something you recognize now in retrospect? Good question. I, I think um, I think it's all retrospective. How do you know that like, you show up <laughs> at some party at 14 and like the people you happen to meet, not because you set out to meet them, but just because they happen to sit next to you at some table mm -hmm. were the people that were going to sort of help influence your path from there. Um, and part of it, too, is, of course, so they were there and they helped influence it, but there were so many other factors that have to play in, um, which is why I always think it's it's – Sometimes silly, sometimes grandiose to try to extrapolate too much from, oh, I did this thing and this other thing, so that means if you do either of those things or if you get involved in that way, that's going to lead to the same result. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, uh, it's funny, I just get this image of chaos theory, and whenever I think of that, I think of like that scene from Jurassic Park where like he lets the drop fall in the um, glass of water and sort of like, oh, these, all these ripples, how can we predict that they're going to happen in just that way? That's often how I feel about the past, though. Like, how can you predict that all these things that have to happen in just that way and just that order leads to that effect? Like, how much can you really extract and extrapolate from that and use it as any helpful guide to what other people should do or what they should look for? Yeah, I, I, I'd have to agree with that. I can't imagine you would, you know, think being a reader of this blog, you would end up being, you know, this, this incredible contributor to, to co-founding this company. Exactly. Like, oh, oh, is that actionable even? I think that's what I like. <laughs> about, like hey, just go read some blogs. And if yeah. one of the co-founders of the company asks for help, write them an email. And you can't extract lessons that are that specific, I think. I think you can extract other lessons, perhaps, that are much more generic and vague and mm -hmm. perhaps not as actionable about sort of just being kind and helpful and curious and all that stuff. But that's also trite, right? Who, who, who would say, oh, I don't want to be helpful. I don't right. want to be curious. I don't want to be kind. Like everyone will say, oh, yeah, I'll do those things. Um, so it's, it's one of those things where I think over the years I've gotten less and less, I don't know, interested in trying to extrapolate those specific lessons on sort of a life arc and yeah. say, hey, there's something you can use that you can apply. <laughs> Well, I, I, my, my ongoing phrase uh, is, is that, you know, you get a compass, not a map. Yes, I think that's, that's a good way of putting it. 
Well, let's let's do this. Let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk specifically about the way you guys have built this company because I mean, you guys really have sort of pioneered an entirely different way of building companies about thinking about business. I mean, I've read your books and you definitely don't do things um, by the book, by any you know, by any measure. I mean, it, that was one of the things that kept me hooked on the talk that you gave at Stanford about forgetting everything you learned in business school. And I thought, yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about, considering I've been to business school. Uh, and I'd love for you to talk about that in more depth. Sure. I think I want to start with basically, um, this is term, uh, problem with authority. Mm. And it's usually banded around as like, that's a bad thing. Like if a kid has problems with authority, like you've got to watch out. Like this is, this is something they should fix. Well, I think for whatever reasons, I've always had a problem with authority. I've always had a deep mistrust of anyone claiming to either know sort of the secret of something or, or, or even codified knowledge, um, which is something I ran into plenty when I went to business school. Like, hey, here's how you run a successful business. And I always kept thinking like, I don't know, man. Like this stuff we're learning right here, it, that just seems like one sliver for one slice of time. And, and usually a slice of time that, that's not now and usually a sliver that's not me or I can't relate to. And I think perhaps that's some of it too, that I just, a lot of what I was sort of taught in business school and school in general, I couldn't relate to it. Like it didn't feel like that applied to me. Um, and that came to a lot of the rules about how you're supposed to build a business and, and so forth. So I think the foundation of, of a lot of the work that we're doing is, is basically just that deep seated mistrust of one from <laughs> other people's experiences. Um, so we basically reverted to first principle. Like I'm going to learn as much as I can from my own experiences, which I know on a sort of societal level is uh, that's perhaps not that great. And I mean, if you try to figure everything out from scratch, are you going to come up with something that's as good as, as what other people have spent decades or millennium perfecting? Well, in a lot of cases, perhaps, yes, it is. Because perhaps right now, all those lessons from two decades ago just don't apply right anymore. Um, and being taught them actually make you worse off than not knowing them at all. So that was that skepticism I had all along going through business school. I went to uh, Copenhagen Business School, what an original name for school, uh, and <laughs> got all this sort of standard teachings on finance and organizational theory and information system design and, and all this stuff. And at the same time, I just kept thinking, it's not that I know better necessarily. It's not that I already know this stuff. Like that's, that's another charge you, you often hear, right? Like, oh, he thinks he knows everything. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I know, knew everything at all. I just, I knew that what they were telling me wasn't right. I don't know how that comes. Uh, maybe that sounds just as arrogant, but I, I thought like, eh, I don't know. I'm going to figure this stuff out on my own. And that's what we tried to do. Just figure everything out as though there was not already a rule book in place. Mm. Just test everything out on, does that feel right for me? Does that, could we do that simpler? Could we not do that? Um, Jason has a, a great story from when 37 Signals got started where they would stop by writing these big proposals to clients because that's what everyone was doing at the time. They would write like a 20 page proposal with wireframes and all this stuff. And he kept thinking like, that seems like a lot of work and, and are we really getting value out of this? Is this really valuable that I'm spending a week writing this huge report? Is, is anyone really reading it? So he went from, from 20 pages to 10 pages and like nobody complained. He went from 10 pages to five pages. Nobody complained. He went from five pages to one page that basically said like, hey, this is who we are. This is how much it's going to cost. This is when it's going to be done. Guess what? Nobody complained. Mm -hmm. Not only did nobody complain, everyone were happy. And it's just, I think, such a perfect example of like, hey, this is the status quo. Everyone is writing these big proposals because they think that's what the client wants. Well, the client didn't want that. The client just wanted to know when is it going to be done, how much is it going to cost, and do I trust you to do the work? That was the three bits of information that they, they needed, right? So there's a lot of that in business and, well, in my opinion, in life, mm -hmm. where people are basically cargo culting. They think like, hey, I watched this guy do this or 
this organization do that, they're successful, that must mean that this method that they're using is good and fits for me. Mm -hmm. Couldn't disagree more. And I think that that's why sort of that uh, talk at Stanford Business School about uh, unlearning your MBA uh -huh. um, was, was really targeted at that, right? That, that a lot of the things you learn in an MBA program or any other business school program are things that were codified in book by huge companies. Like, what does it take to run GE? What does it take to run IBM? And then they present these lessons and methods as though they were general, general applicable business ideas that you can apply this to a company of five people. And what I found through my experience is that exactly the opposite is true. That if you try to apply the methods and learnings of a 100,000 people organization to an organization of five, mm -hmm. you will do great harm to that organization. And it will be worse than not knowing this stuff at all. And I find that the missteps that uh, well, I've made and I observe other people making are very often not that they don't know how to do it, but that they know a way that isn't so, or they know a way that's actively harmful. And they picked up that way from school or book or watching something. They're misapplying something, a pattern where the context doesn't match. And that's where people very often get in trouble. So we've then tried to basically say, okay, we're just gonna consider our own context. We're not gonna to try to reapply patterns from, from other contexts to us. And then, I mean, in some ways, ironically enough, right? We bundled all that, all those impressions and experiences up in, in our own book, and then we <laughs> sold it as like, hey, this is the way to do things. Yeah. Um, which, the irony of that is not lost on you. <laughs> but I, I do think that what is interesting is, is the feedback that we're getting, is that a lot of the messages that we're putting out is very much, hey, um, trust, your, trust your own instincts. Uh -huh. Instincts are not always right, absolutely far from it, but very often they're better than trusting uh, the application of a pattern that doesn't fit, fit your context. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. Huh. Okay, so lots of really interesting stuff here. And I've read both of your books. So I, I think that's really hilarious. That you said the irony is not lost on you. Um, and, and I happen to agree uh, with that idea of uh, looking at something and extrapolating you know, generalized lessons. I mean, I think that happens in the world of the individual content creator online too, right? You see, hey, here's a course on how to build a popular blog. Here's my step-by-step -step formula. And what I often see is people follow that formula to the letter assuming they're going to get the same result. And when they don't, they're very disappointed. And I have always said that's because you're following the damn formula to the letter. It's, it's, you know, I said, you know, you have to model these people, not mimic them. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. I think one of the hardest lessons for humans to not understand, because I think most people understand them, but to internalize and actually follow is mm. that uh, past uh, performance is not a predictor of future results. I mean, you, you get that in small print on every financial uh, <laughs> booklet and so on, and nobody follows it ever. Everyone always thinks past performance equals future results. And I think it's just hardwired into our DNA uh -huh. to, to follow that. And it require, requires just immense 
um, sort of opposition, conscious opposition and constant reminding that that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. And then next day you try to do the same thing. You try to follow something that worked in the past and you're like, what? Why doesn't it work today? Uh Oh, past performance. Okay. So I want to ask you two questions about this. Um, A lot of this, I think, is the byproduct of a lot of cultural conditioning, right? I mean, think about how we are raised in school to follow instructions and get good grades and repeat and regurgitate and learn from the people who are supposedly better than us. And I'm really interested in hearing, uh, one, how you guys start to break this conditioning. I mean, I I can only imagine. My guess is by the time somebody comes to work for you, this is not part of the way they think because they probably wouldn't even get through your hiring process. But I'm just interested in how people start to break this conditioning in their own lives because I think it's so ingrained into us that often we're in a prison of our own creation and we don't even realize it. Couldn't agree more. I think the hardest step is to realize that there's a problem. Mm -hmm. The hardest step is to realize that you've been conditioned, um, that you've been sort of gamed and set up in ways that are not good for you. And I think uh, the school system is is certainly one place of doing it. Another, I'll return to that in a second, but another aspect that just reminded me of was, so uh, my wife, Jamie, is, is from the US, I'm from Denmark, and one of the things, I mean, She's obviously a, a very bright um, uh, person who sort of figured a lot of stuff out, which, which she hadn't figured out perhaps until we started exploring this stuff together, which is how ingrained uh, American indoctrination is. Mm. And, and I think that perhaps that's a, at least for Europeans, is a, is a easier way to look at it because it's, it's easier to recognize because it's easier to recognize something that's not in you. Uh, it's just a, the propaganda machine that sort of works on people and, and how sort of you get indoctrinated in American exceptionalism and so on. But I think the same is true in the school system. And there's all these insidious techniques that traditional schooling apply to you, uh, the whole notion of carrots and sticks, the whole mm-hmm. notion of I- extrinsic motivation, grades and um, tests, and all these things are just so incredibly harmful. And I think uh, one of the ways I broke that for me personally was to realize that failing a test, like you're, the world didn't end. Like, for whatever reason, fairly early on like I had some subjects that I was good at that I cared about and I was interested in Um, and then I had other subjects that I for either entirely or for periods of time I didn't care about and I wasn't interested in so I failed them and I thought that's probably been one of the most instructive events is to realize that getting a bad grade doesn't mean anything in fact, getting a mediocre grade, many of the mediocre grades I've gotten during my schooling were the grades that I was by far the most proud of. Because it taught me that uh, effort and output is not proportionate. That I could get what amounts to maybe a, a C or B minus mm-hmm. with 5% of the effort it took to get an A. And in a lot of subjects, like a B minus was just fine. Like, who's going to care? Like, you think anyone walks up to me today, hey, what did you get in, um, uh, in English in, in high school? Nobody gives a shit, right? Uh, but at the time, when you were in it, when you are a student there, like, there's so much pressure to, like, oh, especially, I mean, I find it even more ridiculous in the U.S., the whole, like, oh, straight-A student. I mean, just straight-A, and my wife was a straight-A student and a valedictorian and all that shit. And I just look at that, and in some ways, I just pity it. I pity people who have straight A's. <laughs> I, I think of that and just think like, what a waste. What a waste of your life and time. Like, it's such a short moment where you're sort of growing up and should be learning about all sorts of other things than just what happens in school sort of at the moment, right? Mm-hmm. But when you've been conditioned to thinking that straight A is somehow the sort of pedestal of living at that time, uh, I mean, you just forgo so many things and you just... Uh, it conditions you in really unhealthy ways, I think. So I think uh, I, I'm a father myself now, and I really hope that when Colt grows up, like he's not a straight A student. I, I, I'll need to have a chat with him if he starts getting straight A's. <laughs> there should be some mix-ups there. There should be some stuff that he chooses. Like, you know what? 
I'm not interested in that. I'm not going to apply myself in that. Or I'm going to apply 5% of, of what I could do in that, and I'm going to get my B minus, and that's going to be great, and I'm going to do a whole lot of other stuff outside of school mm-hmm. that's not in fucking some college prep program or checklist that I have to fill up to to get into some retarded fucking Ivy League school. <laughs> See, now, now you get me all lined up. Um, because what I learned during sort of both high school and I don't know what ninth grade is called in U.S., I think junior high or something. Uh, what I learned was that when I only applied those 5%, like, I had 95% left over. I could do all sorts of really interesting, cool stuff with that. Like I could run a BBS out of my room. I could um, sort of be involved in all these communities. I could do all these other things that were not connected to school. Um, and through high school, same thing. I started running these uh, gaming websites. I started sort of learning about the internet and, and getting involved with all these things. None of that was on the curriculum. And I wouldn't have had time for any of it if what I was trying to do was a straight A shot. And um, yeah, so I think that's just a waste of time. Straight A's waste of fucking time. And the thing too is it doesn't even, doesn't play out. I, the number of people that I know who've sort of quote unquote gotten success, uh-huh. the correlation between that and their academic record or whether they're straight A's, very low. I'd actually say that a large number of straight A students that I've met like are the people who end up in sort of that path of like, oh, then you become a lawyer. Uh-huh. And a lot of lawyers end up hating, like, wait, why did I become a lawyer? Oh, that was the path you were supposed to take once you got straight A's and got into a good college and so forth. And, and they, they wake up one day and they realize, shit, what happened? Well, I, I don't give a shit about writing some stupid ass contract for some corporation. Um, I want to do something more meaningful with my life. Or, and not meaningful in the grand scheme of saving the world, but just something that I care about, something intrinsic. And I think that that's what the straight A whole thing beats out of you that it's all about extrinsic value that it's not about learning subjects and getting good at something and remembering things um it's about just beating the test and what a miserable fucking way of living your life when that's the purpose of your being beating somebody's own or beating somebody else's measure of success Mm -hmm. i can't imagine a worse hell which is why since being conditioned to that and sort of trying to reject that as hard as I could, and I wasn't entirely successful either. Um, I've learned that the most important thing for my continued happiness is to define my own parameters of success. Hmm. Whenever I accept somebody else's measurement stick for what is good or what is successful, it's extrinsic, and I end up not being happy about it. Wow. So let, let's talk about this uh, in more depth. One of the things that's interesting to me, you know, we've talked about it in the context of growing up and, and getting rid of that conditioning from schooling. But now we live in a world where our lives are so publicly on display that every success and every failure uh, pretty much makes its way to your newsfeed. And I'm interested in hearing your perspective on this, you know, from the standpoint of uh you know, founders who struggle with things like founder depression, uh, which you're you're hearing so much more of. And, you know, people are finally starting to admit these kinds of things and dealing with those kinds of failures and, you know, actually navigating them and coming out of the other side of it, uh, having grown from it rather than being demolished by it. Does that make sense? Yep. And I think it ties back to what we were just talking about. I think a lot of, and I'm just extrapolating. I'm not a psychologist. Mm -hmm. I talk to everyone with uh, depression, but I think a lot of it ties back to what you expect to happen. Like if you go into it with this extreme pressure, um, I was going to write this up today. This, this notion of hunger. Mm -hmm. Like we talk about this all the time. Oh, entrepreneurs need to be hungry. Fuck no. You make terrible decisions on an empty stomach. Like, <laughs> you shouldn't be hungry. I, I, I mean, I keep hearing this starvation motivation spiel, usually from people who are not hungry at all, who are very fat and happy on top of their mountain of BC cash, right? Like, it's very easy to tell other people that they should go hungry then. But I think that really ties into it that when you sort of put this pressure cooker on like oh you should be so hungry and like the hungry people and the people who work the hardest are the ones that win no it's not oftentimes it's just fucking the luckiest person that wins 
I say that and and there's like huge asterisks afterwards like that I mean obviously that's not the only thing like you can't just not apply yourself at all and then just right. expect to be lucky and then something's going to happen but you can absolutely apply your very best and your all be smart and be all the things it takes to have success and not have success it happens all the time but people have a I think a way of digesting the narrative that if they don't have success it's because of their somehow like inadequateness as a human being Mm -hmm. and obviously I mean that's a pretty depressing thought like I'd probably get depressed too if that was how I thought of the world Um, so I've tried again constantly to to redefine like what is success Um, because if I define it in such a way where I cannot lose I can't get depressed wow (laughs) so I define it in such a way for example right now right Um, because I find it doesn't end it, it doesn't end at all. Even when people do have supposed success, they start just becoming afraid of no, new things and other things, like losing that success. In mm-hmm. fact, many times that's even worse than the fear of not being successful at all is the success of losing what you have. Yeah. And one of the techniques that I've applied to that, like I don't feel any that there's anything odious about saying, like, I have a lot of shit to lose. Built a successful company over 11 years, still run a successful open source project after 11 years. Like, I got a lot of nice stuff. Like, if I was afraid of losing that all the time, which I think a lot of people are, they are afraid of losing the nice stuff, mm-hmm. then it'd be very easy to sort of apply that pressure cooker to yourself. So, I just keep thinking always about, like, hey, if I lost it all, okay. That'd be fine. Like, I'd, I'd still be able to do many of the things I enjoy the most in the world. I'd still be able to program. Like, it doesn't matter whether I'm, I gone bankrupt or, or whatever. I presumably I'd still be able to program. I'd still be able to play with my son. I'd still be able to do all these other things that these are the things that really make me happy anyway. So, this loss can't really hurt me. And I had the same thing from the outset. Um, hey, if this base camp is not going to be successful. So what? I just learned how to program. I just launched a new uh, app. I, I learned all these other things. Like, would I look back at that time and say that I regretted that time? Absolutely not. I think that's where the problem comes in. The problem comes in when people invest a, an awful lot of their time and ego into something where it only pays off if it pays off. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, it only pays off if it's a success. If it's not a success, they have to look back at those five years and go, Jesus, I wish I'd told that asshole of a VC to go fuck himself. Like, <laughs> but I didn't. And it didn't work anyway. Like, that didn't even help me that I, I didn't. Yeah. And now, like, that's worth being depressed over. Right? When you supplant your intrinsic motivations with these extrinsic goals, you're a prisoner to them. And when things don't pan out the way the always to the sky chasing hockey chart of success is supposed to look like, you look back in that and just feel regret. And I think that that's a terrible feeling, which is why people often ask me like, oh, well, if you look back at like 10 years you've been doing this, like, what do you regret the most? Or what are some of the biggest mistakes you've had? Like, honestly, and maybe this is selective memory, which I think is always very helpful in guarding your own happiness too. But I look back and I'm like, I don't regret a thing. I don't regret anything. I, there was really not anything I would have done differently. And that's not to say, like, oh, we did everything perfectly. Obviously, it's not. Like, we could have done a lot of things that perhaps we would have had more success or we would have done different things or whatever. It's just a mindset. I, I can't look at the past and my path from A to B and, and sort of like, oh, these are all these things that I regret and then still feel good about the work that I'm doing and, and feel good about the work going forward. Yeah. You know, when I, when I hear you say that, I, I think about this blog post that I wrote uh, on my blog this morning titled the infinite value of things that can't be measured. And, uh, you know, the idea that you have no regrets and I think about this show and I wonder at times like, okay, if it didn't pay off, uh, in the way I expected it to, I've gotten to have 500 really fascinating conversations with people and probably received an education that was far more valuable than anything I got in college or business school. Absolutely. I think about the experience and the arc of 10 years with Basecamp in much the same way. Mm-hmm. That if Basecamp was to implode tomorrow, that, I don't know, we did something terrible that somehow ended the company. I had a 10-year run working with amazing people, building products that I really liked, using tools that I truly enjoyed, serving customers that I cared for. 
how is that a bad run? Yeah. How is that something to look back on with regret? Hmm. And I think when you can't answer yes to that, when you're not working with tools you enjoy, you're not working with people you love working with, when you're not serving customers that you absolutely enjoy serving, you have to supplant that with something extrinsic. Well, I did it and I made a million dollars or I don't know, or I guess, sorry, a million dollars is, is petty change these days. I guess a billion dollars <laughs> is what you're supposed to say, right? Yeah. I made a billion dollars and, and that made it all worth it. I mean, Jesus fuck. Like, I, not me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's do this. I, I want to spend the last part of our conversation uh, distilling the principles from your books uh, and into the principles that you guys run your business by for people who, who are not familiar with your work. Sure. Um, it's funny when you sort of put on the spot, like, what are the principles that I would sort of <laughs> pull out and say, like, oh, this is... Um, this is the one that really governs it all. Um, I think, I mean, we can talk about some of the specifics from, from rework. Um, yeah. That's, always, uh, that's what I figured would be the most relevant to our listeners. Sure. So one of the topics that's gotten a lot of play, um, for a long time is this notion that, um, work, the modern work, workplace is a interruption factory that the sanctity of getting shit done is constantly being violated in almost every office that you can work in today. Um, and a lot of that comes from meetings, getting pulled in to meetings because meetings are great, right? Like collaboration is always great and you can't have enough collaboration. That's where the magic happens. Absolutely not. Meetings are often incredibly toxic wastes of time, energy, and motivation. Uh, over collaboration is a real danger that I fear far more than under collaboration in most contexts. The notion that we have to be sort of just constantly collaborating to get stuff done is just uh, insidious in my mind. Yes, of course you have to figure out what you're working on and what you should be working on and which direction we're going. That stuff is incredibly important. And that takes about or should, in my mind, take about 10 to 15% of your time. Then there's the other 90 to 85% of your time where you're supposed to get the actual work done. And getting the actual work done, to me at least, that's where the true happiness lies. Like, I truly enjoy just doing the work. I think that goes back to that notion again, like if, if, you, if you don't enjoy the work, if you're just doing the work because you want something else out of it, man, I pity you. Like find something that you actually enjoy doing for the sake of itself. So for me, that was programming. I just really like to program. I, I should say that with some qualification. I really like to program uh, Ruby. I really like to program web applications. Uh, there are other domains and tool sets where my enjoyment drops off significantly. But for what I'm doing, I really enjoy doing it. So I want to do that for long periods of uninterrupted time. That's how I get stuff done. And it's amazing just how much stuff you can get done if you have, say, four hours of basically no interruptions. No meetings you're getting pulled into. Um, you're, you're sort of turning off all those interruptions and just get stuff done. It's just that cloud. And that cloud, I think, comes from this notion of flow. There's a great book book by uh, an author, Mikhail, and then mm -hmm. I can't pronounce his last name, yeah. called Flow, that talks about these interviews that he's done with, I think, hundreds of people, where he talked about, like, what's your most, what's your happiest state? And it basically all boils down to people's happiest state is this flow state. When you're working on problems where time and space sort of drift in the background and, and you're just working just beyond perhaps your capabilities or your current knowledge or how you figure things out um, and you're learning something new and you're building something great, it's just, it's just bliss. And I, I think it's just a travesty how we make it so hard in many companies and workplaces to enter that zone. You cannot enter that zone if something is on your schedule or if somebody comes knocking on your door every 45 minutes or every hour and a half. It just will not happen. Like you can try to squeeze work into these work moments. It's not a work day. And not getting a work day, this notion, this feeling of like a good day's work. Like that's, I really love that. Like there's nothing 
more rewarding than sort of closing your computer at the end of the day and feeling like that was a great work day. I, I really got something good done. I made progress. Like, that to me is is bliss in that. Mm, what do you call it? Almost uh, a common monotone sense of bliss. It sounds like a contradiction, but it's the bliss that you can have day in and day out. And there's not a whole lot of other stuff like that, right? Most of the sort of things when people think about bliss or pure happiness, they think about these fleety, rare moments that only happen once every few months or once a year or something. Like that's where you really capture the happiness or the vacation or whatever. Screw that. Like you're working so much every time. The majority of working hours for most people is that they're, they're working, right? I want to make sure that that period is bliss, that that is everyday happiness and, and that that in turn will translate into an overall satisfaction with life that's just unable or sort of impossible to reach otherwise. Um, so rework has a, a bunch of sort of techniques for, for trying to do that. Um, protecting that space, protecting your flow from meetings, interruptions, the workplace, your boss, your colleagues, and, and other forms of interruptions. And then the other part of it that we're focused on is, is trying to soothe your natural fears of doing stuff. Doing stuff like, oh, I don't know enough, or I don't have enough time, or I don't have enough money, or any of these other fear-based excuses that people usually sort of tell themselves or sort of get themselves wrapped up into and are the reasons why they are not feeling happy about the things that they're doing or never get started on doing anything at all. So if we take just one of those, for example, um, not enough money or not enough resources, right? Like everyone always thinks that, oh, if I could just put together the perfect team, like with uh, money was no object and I could hire everyone I wanted and um, there's just no constraints. If there were no constraints of my work, imagine what I could do. Yes, let's imagine that. There are plenty of organizations today who are in exactly that situation. Like uh, an example we've always used is Microsoft, right? Microsoft has all the money in the world. Like their enterprise business is still a cash cow of epic proportions. Like somebody within Microsoft can pitch an idea and get all the resources that they want. Is that the happiest place to work on earth, you think? I don't know. Hmm. Um, and I actually think that the opposite is true. That the happiest moments that I've had is when I've had not quite enough time, not quite as much of a team that I would want, uh, all sorts of constraints on the expression, a frame. Like when you just have a complete blank canvas and you can do and paint or use whatever tools that you want and take as long as you want, that is really hard. Like it's like staring at that blank page and having writer's block. But when you have some very specific boundaries of like, hey, we have three people to make this feature and if it doesn't ship in, in five weeks, that's not gonna be correct. Um, so we're going to have to figure out a version of what it is that we're working on that fits those constraints. That is what I absolutely damn love. I love sort of having the constraints set up and then working within that space and then optimizing within that space. It's funny, tying back to the conversation we had earlier about the demo scene, it reminds me about some of the demos that, um, that people would write back in the days. They had, uh, I think it was four kilobytes four kilobytes to make something happen inside of that, right? To make something, a cool graphic demonstration happen. That is some real damn constraints. We don't have those anymore on a technical level, but we absolutely still have them at organizational levels. And I, I really just enjoy that. And it's funny, when I talk to other entrepreneurs or business owners that are either still running the business or have sold their business, do you know what they all talk about? They don't talk about the now. They don't talk about the, oh, I sold the business, that that was the moment of glow and bliss when the millions cleared into their bank account. Or if they're still running the business, they're not talking about, oh, yeah, I have uh, these, I don't know, 15 staff meetings lined up for next week. I'm super duper excited about that. What they all talk about is the beginning. Mm -hmm. They all talk about the constraints. Oh, you remember when we were just like eight people and like we had really to – although I kind of hate that word, hustle to get something shipped. I, that's what people look back on with affection. 
that these moments of constraints are, are really the moments of affection. And we don't know it at the time, and we don't even, even when we sort of reminisce about it later, most people don't draw the connection and think, hey, wait a minute, I could do that again. I could ensure that I keep setting myself up for situations that have constraints and that that's a way to produce flow and get happiness out of it. But um, yet there it is. Hmm. Wow. Uh, so I have two last questions for you. Uh, at this point, I mean, you guys have done very well. And I've asked this to a number of people who have reached a, a point of sort of significant wealth about how the accumulation of money or uh, getting to a place of financial security uh, to the point where you probably don't have to work again. I mean, how has that changed your perspective on wealth and money? It's funny because it, in some ways... Uh, I'm going to talk about it, but I want to preface it with, in some ways, like it's conversations that most people won't touch with a 10 foot pole, I find <laughs> because it's, it's, it's toxic in a way that, um, you can't explain to other people. Uh -huh. Like I can't, it's very hard to explain or try to rationalize now that like my life is only marginally better now that I have this sort of, I don't have to work wealth. Uh -huh. than it was when I was sitting in my little studio apartment in Copenhagen and making $15 an hour working for Jason on this single file app. Like, I've added 2%, right? Again, I understand that's not the situation. Like, if you're in abject poverty and you're in a hard time sort of making ends meet to get food on the table or if you have dependents, different situation, Mm. Right. A lot of people I talk to, they're not in those circumstances. So for those, um, they still think that this magic thing is going to happen when they have enough money not to need to work anymore. That like bliss is somehow just going to flow into their life and every day is going to be different. You know what? Not at all. <laughs> it really isn't. And uh, the, f the first experience I had with that was um, Jeff Bezos made a minority investment back in I'm trying to remember when it was. It was 2006 where he bought a small chunk of uh, base camp straight from Jason and me, which meant that both Jason and I um, all of a sudden had zeros that our bank account had never seen before, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking at the time, wow, this is going to be just so... Imagine like what I could do with this money or I wouldn't need to do or whatever. And, and I thought about that for like a couple of days and then the check cleared. And you know what? Then it was Monday. And it just didn't matter. Like, again, of course it mattered. It mattered at the edges and I got to do some nice things and so on. But on that sort of what happens every day level, it just didn't really matter. And th that's, I find that you, you, you can't tell somebody that. Like nobody's willing to accept that on somebody else's experience, which is basically right. a topic that's kind of hard to talk about. Like they all think, yeah, that's easy for you to say now. Nah, you're fucking rich. <laughs> um, right? And then all of a sudden... Which is the other thing, too. I, I find a lot of discussions online, they, they go, like, some person has a problem or depressed or whatever, and then somebody says, well, the person is rich. What do they have to complain about? You know what? Like, the problems are the same. Mm -hmm. Sorry. They're not the same. There are different problems, and some problems are directly related to money. I accept that. Um, for a lot of people who are sort of entrepreneurs or able to get good-paying knowledge jobs, like, the difference is really uh, much smaller, much, much smaller than most people would, uh, would agree. Or maybe that's not true for all people. Maybe that's just my experience, right? Maybe I'm very unique in like, um, not having had a sort of huge impact to my emotional well-being from mm -hmm. going from not having a large bank account to having a large bank account. But I, I, don't, I don't tend to think so. So the one thing I think that it has brought is sort of just this notion of calm. Um, that comes from the fact that like, oh, okay, so we won whatever game you want to call this game of like having to assess on a big bank account, right? Mm -hmm. So now that game is not there anymore. Even more clarity to just figure out like, what is it that I actually want to do with my life? Like a lot of people can put that off when they think, oh, I'm just going to work towards this goal. This goal is going to be this magic land of financial independence, um, and when I reach it, oh, I don't really know what I have a plan for reaching it, but when I reach it, it's all going to be bliss, right? Like, so we got there, and it kind of looked the same as the day before and the day before that. Uh, so you realize, okay, that's not where source of happiness is going to come from. 
I am going to have to find it in much more mundane activities. And these mundane activities are exactly as we've been talking about, the intrinsic uh, flow of just doing good work, working with great people, uh, working on interesting problems, working with environments that you care about, and sort of trading it all off and having a nice balance that that life is not sort of about chasing something. It's not about being hungry. Mm. It's not about like, oh, I want to eat something else. I want to eat something bigger. I want to get to that magic billion dollars, right? Like, how the hell is that going to change my life? Not at all, right? Mm. Well, uh, I have one last question for you, uh, which is how we finish all our interviews at uh, Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Honesty. I'd say, I'd say very often people could be so much more interesting to themselves, to others, if they were just honest. Like if they weren't so afraid of like, oh, how am I going to look if I say this? I, I find that that's the, the easiest hack that I found for sort of PR is on both a company and a, and a personal level, just to be honest, hmm. telling things the way you see them. And I mean, I guess some people's honesty is not a very pretty honesty and I mean, maybe they should shut up. But <laughs> most people, this honesty is actually really interesting. And most people have really interesting observations and thoughts and things they want to do and views in the world. They just, they're afraid to share them because they think that they're going to look, make them look funny or weak or whatever. Um, once you get over that hump and stop sort of caring, oh, what's it going to look like if I say something stupid? Um, life gets better. <laughs> it gets more interesting. Like, Maybe this is self-serving because I have so little filter between my brain and my mouth um, that it serves me well to say that, uh, that that's what makes you interesting. But, but I really do believe it. I, I find that, uh, and this is even, I mean, we've been going at this for, for a long time now, right? Over a decade where we've been public personas saying things about things and thinking things about things in public. Um, and from the get-go, I'd say both Jason and I were pretty honest and pretty forthright. But I feel like it just gets better the more honest, the more forthright, the more willing to admit mistake and flaws and opinion and so on that we get. Um, and the more unmistakable it becomes because of it. Hmm. David, this has been phenomenal. Uh, really, really eye-opening and uh, insightful and thought-provoking. Uh, really, I think you're going to shift a lot of people's mindsets with a conversation like this. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us and, and share all of this with our listeners. This has been absolutely my pleasure. And I, I really um, I appreciate the optimism that you have. I, I've been trying to shift people's minds for over a decade now. And I think one of the things I've found is like, you know what? People's minds shift when they're willing to and ready to shift them. Like there's very little that somebody else can do. Uh, they can do a slight little nudge, and if we nudge some people, that's great. But actually, turning somebody's mind on fundamental issues—that's um, an uphill battle. But maybe I'm just getting too old and too pessimistic about that. So I enjoy the optimism and <laughs> um, so sort of, yeah. yeah. Cool. Anyway, thanks a bunch for having me on, and yeah, I do hope that people enjoyed it. I think that's—I mean. I don't want to keep rambling on, but uh, I think that uh, that's often the best you can do. Like, even if people think like, oh, yeah, that might shift my mind. If they just enjoyed it, then at least they have a good time for an hour. And yeah. People's lives are better if they have a good time for an hour. Awesome. Well, for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.